Are there any questions? I'm sure there must be questions, but who's going to be bold enough to ask the first question? Yeah, I thought that might happen. So funnily enough, I have a question for our panelists. So despite Piranese's constant claim to be Venetian architect, Piranese Architetto, as he signs himself again and again, and although he, as Mario pointed out, thinks of the world in terms of buildings, is it fair to say that he actually draws more like a painter, maybe akin to Hubert Robert, than like an architect or an archaeologist? Well, th this is working, yes? Yes. First of all, there weren't archaeologists at that time. And, um, you know, the, so the notion of sure. drawing like an archaeologist wouldn't have. have well, had I'm just thinking, you know, ahead to the next generation as. as sure. The previous, like they yeah, sure. Um, he, as, as Mario has shown us, when he wants to draw like an architect, as with the Draw the projects for the Tribune of the Lateran, he knows how to do that. He's perfectly capable. Um, now, you might say that it's a very pictorial right. um, Are those approach really to architects' this. drawings? Um, and there, you, if you made comparisons to more or less contemporary architectural drawings, I'm thinking of Fuga for mm -hmm. Santa Bene Maggiore, for example, you would see real differences. They don't have that, um, that oomph. Um, they're, they're, they're not dazzling. Uh, by the same token, many of them are rather more working drawings than they are presentation drawings. Presentation sure. drawings have to have punch. Um, I think that someone else has to take over here. I mean, th th <laughs> this is a question that, um, um, you know, where does we, we um, Well, I think in your talk, you have very well showed that Mike. It's, it's on. Just hold it up. It's on. Yeah. Hold it up. I think your talk very well showed, you know, how Piranesi, in his drawing of ruins and so forth, these are pictorial. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the language, the technique, the little squiggles to show sure. various aspects of the surface textures, ruins, and so forth. Um, this is really much more pictorial, and then he makes them even more so when he converts them into etchings. Pictorial, but at the same time analytical. Um, yes, yeah, so definitely analytical. Uh, and, that's, mean, and that's, I think, then what leads John, say, to, to yeah. raise the question of archaeological. All three of those are bound up uh, with the, the architectural dimension. Sure. Uh, 1750. There are pages and pages in the modern sketchbook um, uh, on the and, mm, description of the magnificent mm, college. Mm -hmm. And that th th those pages start with the with the theme given by the, the Academy of Saint Luke for the uh, for the concourse. I don't know how to say that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Competition. competition for that year at the Academy okay, was right, the college. Right. And then there is this uh, I don't know if it's William Chambers who writes Pyrenees yeah. was challenged by French architects who thought he was not an architect at all and he couldn't draw architecture. Piranesi takes the, he participates, he shows how he could participate and win the, the competition at the Academia di San Luca for architects by drawing the plan, which is perfectly mm -hmm. drawn and, and etched. And together with that, uh, he complied with the, with the, um, uh, with the list of drawings that for the for the application of the, of the concourse of the contest, with um, fronts and and sections which are not preserved. Or no, he may have sketched them, but he didn't etch them anyway. But he etched the stairs of the college, meaning that it was on more floors and. And, and then he talks about the, the fronts, the prospetti. So by 1750, he's 30, he can draw perfect architecture perfectly well. And he demonstrated to the French architects who uh, thought he was not able because he was too... Yeah, uh, I totally imagined. agree with you. But then the rest of Chambers, where he says, and thereby proved 
that he knew nothing. <laughs> uh, yes, yes. But because that's just jealousy. I mean, we don't yeah, take that right, seriously. Right, right, because it proved, the, 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 yeah. the print proves yeah. exactly the opposite. Yeah, yeah. And he totally. knew Bernini, he knew yeah. Borromini, he knew yeah. how to deal with a very complex and uh, utopian institution for the arts. Uh, and, and then simply chooses not to do that again. Yeah. You know, having having achieved that success, he then Have moves proven. on and yeah. goes off doing his own thing once again. Andre, you had a question. If you say it, I'll repeat the question back to everyone. Right. So, in a way, yeah, I mean, is there anyone else at the time who operates in this world who, who so readily rejects the conventions of architectural drawing, you know, be that yeah, analytical drawing, be that. Because there's so many elements in the archaeological books. If you look through the Antiquità Romani, mm -hmm. we love the views. I love the views. <laughs> but then you get all of the ground plans and the sections. And so, in a way, he never rejects uh, architectural right. drawing of the more academic type. It's just he limits it. He uses it as necessary. But you know, even in those wonderful big foldouts for the for the Emissario del Lago Albano, mm -hmm. you know, you have a view here, and then you have a section here, and then you have a ground plan here. And so, he finds it easy to combine all of right. these things in a general decorative scheme. And in terms of the drawings, we have to remember the survival. I mean, there's one, one of those fragments on the back of my window wall is a partial plan of the amphitheater at Albano. But, you know, and then there are the, the fragments of the ground plans of the ladder in that appear on the margins and in the backs of drawings. But that's not a kind of drawing that he kept if he made yeah, it. Yeah, no, and then that doesn't get prized right. by collectors, so it doesn't get kept and mm -hmm. traded, you know, from dealer right. to collector and so forth. So, and indeed, well, right. I think no, it would be, unless it was a one-to-one -one correspondence, it would be very hard to recognize one of his iconographic. Well, well no, yeah. but that's where we have the, the, the wondrous survival of the the Morgan and Carl's Roussettes, where they don't have to be collector drawings. They're things that remain in the studio, and so we, we can look for that material. It didn't have to be a prized, finished presentation yeah. drawing in order to survive, and yet we still don't really have them, except in a few cases. Yeah, that's what I'm saying, is that, that the, it's the, the absence of the drawings which relate to, and I think, of course, these prints were yeah. based on drawings. sketches, drawings, that, but they just don't survive, or they were never, you know, prized. And even in the groups in Karlsruhe, and here, you know, you don't have a lot of ethnographic drawings. Oh, yes. I mean, for the 214 illustrations in the Antiquità Romane, many of which are plans, sections, mm -hmm. and, and analytical drawings, there's not a single one. Uh, uh, right. There's not a single plan, section, or analytical uh, drawing. Right. None. Those that survive are those are, are the drawings that, many of which are earlier drawings that are related to the frontispieces, mm -hmm. which are yeah. fantastic. Or, Sure. Are not analytical, but rather mm -hmm. uh, rather uh, imaginative, pictorial, yeah. pictorial and imaginative. Yeah. yeah. I was I was always wondering about this issue about the French Academy at the time. I'm sorry, very briefly, but um, paradoxically, we are informed so much better about any provincial, regional, école gratuite de dessin, yeah. any of these free drawing schools in France, than we are informed in terms of what was going on in the French Academy in Rome. Uh, we don't know the curricula, we know who's there at the time through the correspondences, etc. but we don't really know what happened. But the thing I was always sort of uh, impressed by or, or stunned by, uh, if one looks at these albums by Antoine, by Paris, by everybody else, hardly anybody draws after Piranesi's etchings. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Although, I mean, the, in terms of the curriculum at the academy, 
Christoph, you, know, you and I were looking yesterday through a sketchbook that Sergal brings back to Sweden, given to him by Cadez, according to Sergal's inscription, and it's full of everything. Sculptural fragments, pictorial devices, history paintings, you know, and if that is a sketchbook made sort of around the French Academy, it suggests there's not separate curricula for sculptors, architects, painters, but that whatever limited group of people have access to it are, are all doing everything. There's, there's still so much of Saint-Nom in this, and, and I think, once again, the Griffonis by Saint-Nom and the reception, I don't think, have been sufficiently studied. And when we looked at it, we also looked at Pajou and Pajou's presence. And of course, in the archives of uh, Marianne Roland Michel at the Petit Palais in Paris, um, Cailleux was, was you know, selling off for a long time a very, very substantial part of these Pajou albums. Um, it's absolutely fascinating to see why chambers would engage with yeah. Pajou and first generation. And that, again, is, is a paradigmatic change because it, it seems to remain in the academy and it's not transferred to the second generation. So when Giovanni Battista, for example, proposes Paris as architectural draftsman to Francesco, I think that is very significant. Mm -hmm. um, and all the other names he gives are contemporary names, not of his generation, but in fact, the, the, the successors. Yeah, yeah. It really seems about, I'm sorry, I'm, I've been laboring this a bit. It seems to be about succession, but also artistic succession at a moment when he realizes there are three periods in his life and the, the last was dedicated you know, to all the, the, the applied projects from the Camini to the sculptures to the Candelabra and the antiquities sellout and, and, and design issues on a major scale. And he sort of seems to abandon this increasingly. I mean, he's got the, he's the mastermind. He, he really keeps it all together, but he's got his people to do this. And paradoxically, we don't know who these people are who actually execute mm -hmm. Right. Uh, but there's so, a question up in the back. Oh yes, I mean there are drawings. There are drawings in the exhibition of of Pozzuoli and Pompeii, and there's a set of of drawings that relate to a trip to Pestum. I don't think he makes it any. I don't think he makes it any further south than Pestum. Yeah. So the question is, is there a financial benefit to rejecting the traditional approach to drawing to, to study? I, I mean, I think, I think there's a financial, yeah, I mean, I think Piranese is, he's created an enterprise all his own. I mean, he's different from everyone else and recognizable and, and, and becomes a, a standard stop for every visiting artist, architect, patron. I mean, the, I, I think he, he, he figured out how, I mean, we talk, we've talked about how he, he recreates himself several times. I think once he settles into being the enterprise that is Piranese, uh, yeah, there is a, he becomes fabulously wealthy through the, the various facets, printmaking, antiquities dealing, decorative art creating. Um, you know, he finds his niche and, and exploits it very, very well. He, he's very rich by the time he dies. Yeah. And, and drawing is a, is a key tool in all of those enterprises, yeah. but it's a mean that's how, drawing gets him to the point where he has a product which then yields money. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Armin, you had a question. No. So he comes from an intrinsic understanding of architecture, which some of these very, very quick sketches in the modern of sketchbooks point out. So he doesn't need the details, but he understands volume, architectural space and volume. And the misunderstanding, which apparently seems to be happening at the time of the year, so the, the, kind of the, the nerdy French architect saying, the guy doesn't know a thing. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But
<laughs> and Rome's disappointing in comparison. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, I mean, it looks more like a Vasi than a, than a Piranesi. In, in, uh, in, in, in we, we see the same uh, kind of disappointment also from Weinbrenner. He also uh, writes that in his uh, diary. Yeah. I think this might be a subject of a great exhibition, you know, being disappointed in Rome. I mean, this is also <laughs> Anna Amalia of Saxony Weimar. I mean, she, she comes to Rome, she's totally <laughs> devastated, and she flees off to Naples, and this is where she finally meets the mundane antiquarian life she was aspiring to. Flaxman also, I mean, he, he, he comes down in the 90s, and he writes back this letter to John Gunn and saying, Peronese is just a pest. And, and uh, so there's the, this extraordinary, extraordinary sort of disillusionment because the guy has monumentalized it to such an extent that none of these, sorry, John, none of these ruins seem to be speaking. <laughs> <laughs> Not in themselves, but through Piranesi, yes. <laughs> I mean, it's the medium. Exactly, I mean, I think, you know, clearly this also is, in terms of the kind of problematic we're talking about, is clear upon the publication of the Antiquità Romane. I mean, you know, it's a revolution. It's not, I mean, if you put that book side, the four volumes side by side with Degaudé, I mean, you're talking about the ice mother with Degaudé and a full-blooded human being with Piranesi. And so I, I think this is, it's just very, very different from that kind of old-fashioned French architectural drawing, but people like Robert understand him perfectly. Clarisseau understands him perfectly, mm -hmm. and the later ones, Boulet and so forth, they see his vision. Yeah. They're not worried about, you know, whether it's two and a half palmy or two and three quarters palmy. They see this vision of antiquity, and that, of course, is communicated largely by his pictorial right. arrangement, whether it's in which with prints, of course, he does, the, the drawings don't circulate enough for the drawings to be influential, though I think people who see the drawings, like Robert, you know, are amazed by them as well. But it's the prints, it's the yeah. books, which really make his reputation, and, and it's immediate. I mean, and Hector Rami, I mean, my God, you know, you, I can't remember, 200 to Paris? And, you know, immediate reactions from Mariette and Contiquilis. And, of course, they're all fussy about, you know, is this really, and so forth. But that's not the point. The point is this vision yeah. of antique Rome. Also, because he was a true revolutionary. I mean, his, idea, his, his ideas are reflected in his drawings, but his ideas are in, in, in impressive. I mean, he, against aristocracy, for the freedom of the artist, and and and. Francesco takes on that, 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 that his father's ideas and he becomes a true revolutionary during the French Revolution. And we, we well, at least in Rome, uh, for the Roman Republic, and, and Piranesi is the same against the Pope, against the, 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 the Lord Charlemagne and so on. Yeah, the he great writes, letters of justification where he says, you know, uh, uh, a nobleman is the last descendant of his line, but an artist the is the first of yes. his lines. This is a very yes. different but attitude. But he had, he had to quit Rome for a few weeks yeah, because yeah, the Pope... Because uh, they were threatening him. Yeah, right. Those noblemen. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think we have time for one more question before five. Uh, Alexander up in the back. So, so is that, are, are, are Pyrenees and Winkelmann opposite poles, or are they really parts of, uh, of the same thing? It's an interesting question. Part of the same thing. <laughs> but it is, you know, the, I mean, in the most general terms, 
you know, talking about general terms, I think that um, no other artist I know um, influences both of these old dichotomies, which we know are really not dichotomies. So we talk about Romanticism and Neoclassicism. Piranesi influences both enormously. And it's that combination which is really, I think, distinctive of Piranesi, that he could have such an enormous effect on crazies like De Quincey, you know, but then also yeah. on Boulet. Sure. I mean, you know, it's, it's really this combination. But also Robert Adam. And sure. Robert Adam, who, when we look at his drawings, as John Pinto showed, I mean, you know, dull as dishwater. Yeah. <laughs> well, he, he was still learning. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know whether he ever learned. <laughs> no, and, and actually, Adam makes interesting drawings when he's forgetting about buildings and, yeah. and doing fantastic drawings, like the, the yes. one in the lobby right. and, and a related album that we have in the collection. I fear that we're out of time for more recorded formal questions, um, but I hope you'll um, stay and, and talk to our speakers as we move up into the lobby. Thank you all for coming, and thank you most of all to our speakers. It's, it's I think, been a very, very rich afternoon.